Welcome everybody. This is Survey of the Old Testament. This is night one, session one. Before we get started, I'm going to go over the syllabus with you guys. The assignments are very simple. It's class participation, 15%. Um, group chat discussions, which what that is, is if you look at the back of your book, at the end of about every chapter, there's these really neat study questions. And simply, when you're reading through the week, just pick your two favorite questions each week and post your answer to that question in the group chat. Feel free to list the question too, that way people know what you're answering too, or that'll look kind of funny. Um, so you're looking for two of those a week, so by the end of the class you should have eight questions. So you're just picking your favorites as you read along. And then the rest and the bulk of your grade will be your weekly quizzes. So you'll have one per week. It's pulled from your textbook, open book, like normal. And you guys should really enjoy those. Some of them, they're, they're not you know trick questions. A couple of them will go ahead and have you think because there's some points, especially in the Old Testament, that it's really good to know that you know some of the stuff that you're looking at. So some of those kinds of questions will be on there, but like our policy, like at least in this case, I am not out to, to trick you. I, def, I just want you guys to learn to have this awesome knowledge. Okay. So you can see also you've got your weekly reading assignments um, at the bottom of the syllabus showing what chapters are roughly getting covered each week and those chapters will correspond with each quiz. So quiz one is going to be off of one through nine, quiz two, ten through nineteen, and so on. And with that, I'll go ahead and pray. Father God, thank you for bringing everybody to this class tonight. I thank you that we're all going to have a, just a great time as we dive into your word and into this, um, this portion of the Bible that you created. Thank you for showing us um, your intention and your purposes behind it and for uh, giving us plenty of wisdom throughout the night and for guiding me as I speak in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So before we uh, jump into this, the big question I want to answer is, like, Why? Why is it so vital? Why is it good to go ahead and study something like this, like the Old Testament? And the thing is that as Christians, we know that we've been given the Bible and that it's an incredible resource for our lives. It's a sword in spiritual warfare. It's comfort in many different cases. It's knowledge. It's wisdom. And the more you dive into it, the more you get out of it. And considering that the Old Testament is two-thirds of that resource, that's the piece you don't want to miss. So... What we're looking at in doing a survey of the Old Testament is we're going to be looking at when these books were written, why they were written, what makes uh, each book unique, and um, all that other stuff. So the core purpose, though, behind this survey is to uncover the context and the heart behind each book. Because when you understand why something was written, it makes it that much easier to get things out of it. You're able to identify with figures in scripture, you're able to identify with what they're learning. And um, when you look at uh, scripture, which specifically if you look at Romans 11:17, it says, but some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel have been broken off. And you Gentiles who were branches from a wild olive tree have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. And the, the point that these verses from Romans are conveying is the fact that when we got saved, we got grafted into the family of Abraham. The promises for Israel became a part of our promise. Their story became part of our story. So when you look at this, this is part of your story. And then finally, we'll also get to explore how Christ is revealed in each book of the Old Testament because at the very core... He's the center of it all. Christ said so himself. And we get to discover what God was doing throughout, what God was telling people, and how his plan of salvation runs through, beginning to end, Old Testament included. You guys ready? Yeah. So, first section we have is Christ as the key to the inspiration and the canonization of the Bible. The canon, simply put, are the books of the Bible that are recognized as being genuine and inspired by God. So the canonization is the process that people used in determining which of those books met those qualifications. So first up, the New Testament, when you look at things, we know it to be a historically accurate document. Jesus confirmed in it that the Old Testament is the divinely authored word of God. Some general claims that Jesus made about the Old Testament was that scripture cannot be broken, 
that Scripture must be fulfilled, and that the ignorance of Scripture is also the source of error. Several New Testament writers also held the Old Testament to be inspired by God. And what's important to remember is that at this time, when Jesus said these things, there was no New Testament. So when he's talking about Scripture, he's talking about the Old Testament, because that is the only Scripture around. He also made very specific claims about the Old Testament. And when people say specific citations, they mean he made references to very specific points and events, like Moses, talking about people like David. And interestingly, a lot of the specific things that Jesus mentioned and held as true are a lot of the major things that critics struggle with today, things like the flood, the burning bush, Jonah being in the whale for three days, and so on. And in doing all these things, Jesus himself verified the accuracy and the inspiration of the Old Testament. Christ is also the key to what ends up going into the canon. Jesus himself ended up confirming the 39 books of the Old Testament and only the 39, and we'll explain how. So, first, first off, reasons that the Apocrypha were not included in the Old Testament, and basically, the Apocrypha were a group of books that in 1546, um, the Roman Catholic Church met at the Council of Trent, and their meeting was centered around the issue of these 11 books that they felt were inspired but had been left out by the Protestants. And these books became known as the Apocrypha. The reason that they aren't in our canon is because, one, the Jews never considered them to be inspired. And considering that the Jews were the primary audience, they would know pretty well. Um, second, Jesus never quoted or affirmed the books of the Apocrypha like he did the Old Testament books, and neither did any of the New Testament writers. Um, third, there's historical contradictions within the Apocrypha, when Scripture is supposed to be without error. Um, the Apocrypha itself also never claims to be inspired, and none of it was ever included in the Jewish Old Testament. So from those basic points, they were left out. Um, what's interesting, and what ends up being a key later on, is that the Old Testament was known as the Law and the Prophets. So whenever you're reading your scripture, especially in the New Testament, and you hear either Jesus or people talk about the Law and the Prophets, that was their name for the Old Testament package. It's like us saying Old Testament is when they say, you've heard it written in the Law and the Prophets. It's like us saying, you've heard it read in the Old Testament. It's the same deal. So Jesus called those two sections all the scriptures, verifying the canon of 39 books. Now, the only difference when you look at what's contained in the Law and the Prophets versus ours is sometimes it looks like there's a few less books, but that's because the Jews combined books. So where we have 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, they just had Samuel. So in a couple cases, things were combined, but the content is the same. And then here... In broad, if anyone has had New Testament survey, you've seen parts of this covered, but this is a general of all eight, and they're basically the eight major sections of the, of the Bible, Old and New Testament, where Christ is the theme of both of them. So for the Old Testament, you have the law, history, poetry, and prophecy. Mm -hmm. And then New Testament, you have the Gospels, Acts, the Epistles, and Revelation in which you can see yeah, Christ is revealed as everything from foundation, preparation, there's aspiration, expectation for him. In the Gospels, he's manifested, acts as the propagation of Christ. The Epistles is the interpretation and application of Christ, while Revelation is the consummation of all things in Christ. And there's a handout, fun resource for you guys at the front. If you didn't have a chance to get it when you came in, you can get it during the break that basically just gives you a quick one sentence blip of how you can see Christ automatically in all the 66 books. And we'll get to dive into that in even more detail as the night goes on. So now we're going to jump into our introduction to the books of the law, which is the first division of your Old Testament. We mentioned before that you started with your division of two, the Law and the Prophets. As time went on, eventually this was divided into three divisions in the Jewish Old Testament, where you had the Law, the Prophets, and Writings. So your Law was going to be the same first five, the Prophets were going to cover your prophetic things, and then Writings was going to be a blend of kind of the histories and poetry and everything else that didn't fall under Law and Prophets. And then finally you came to the fourfold division that we have today.
And while the category brackets changed, the content was the same between them. They were just being categorized in different ways. But the writings we have never changed. We have exactly what they did. So when you look at the structure of the books of the law, you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then you can see the meanings of each name next to them for us in English. Genesis means origin or beginning. Exodus is departure. Leviticus is the book of the Levites. Numbers is numbering or counting. While Deuteronomy is the second law or the second giving of the law. And what is very neat about this is that if you start looking at the Hebrew names, the Hebrew names for the first five books, if you go in their Jewish Old Testament, they're taken, the names are derived from the first few words of each book. So in Genesis 1-1, we have the phrase, in the beginning, which is where their name comes from. In Exodus, their meaning is names, because Exodus 1-1 says these are the names of the sons of Israel. Leviticus is, and he called, in which Leviticus 1-1 says, the Lord called to Moses. Numbers 1-1 reads, A year after Israel's departure from Egypt, the Lord spoke to Moses in the tabernacle in the wilderness of Sinai. And finally, Deuteronomy 1-1 says, These are the words that Moses spoke. So you have a very neat where they just pulled, here's the main point right off verse 1, and that's where they got the names for their books and how their meanings followed. So that sums up our intro. Any questions, neat points? This is a, I, I love discussion, and this is a class where discussion is great. So each time we go through a book, I'm going to have some minutes where we purposely go ahead and pause so discussion can fly around. And if you have questions before we get to those points, like by all means, throw up your hand and we'll have some fun. Okay? Go for it. What is the Torah? So the Torah is their package, is basically their name for the first five books. And then there's additional books um, as well. Anybody else? All right, here we go. So Genesis is basically the origination of the nations. So the author of Genesis is Moses. Some fun facts about Moses. He was a Hebrew who was rescued from Egyptian genocide by the wisdom of his mother and the compassion of Pharaoh's daughter. God spoke to his mom at a time where the Egyptians were having all of the male sons of the Hebrews slaughtered by throwing them into the Nile. She put him in a basket, and God guided that toward the Egyptians' um, Pharaoh's daughter, and she raised him in her household. We can see evidence in Scripture that he lived like the Egyptians, because when he rescued strangers who lived outside of Egypt, they described him as an Egyptian, not as a Hebrew. That's in Exodus 2, 16 through 19. Moses had wealth. He had influence, and yet he chose to leave that life of luxury behind when God called him to lead his people. These were people that he had never done life with. He didn't grow up knowing these people. He grew up in the palace in a completely different culture, and yet he responded and he knew this was his true people. This was who God called him to. He led his people out of Egypt and continued to lead them for 40 years in the wilderness until the time of his death. So, some proof for uh, the authorship of Moses. The first one is that the earliest and continual tradition of the Jewish people attributes Genesis to Moses. And by the way, for anything that you don't see on your screen, at the end of the class, you will have the slides updated with the instructor notes. You're not tested off the slides, you're tested off the books, but you will still have that as a full resource at the end. Um, Moses is the only person we know of from this point in time who had the education and ability to write all of this. You have to remember that the rest of the nation are uneducated slaves at this point. Another proof is that Moses was the only one who had both the interest and the information to write Genesis. He had access to these kinds of records and he would be invested in knowing these things. And finally, citations from Genesis show that the rest of the Old Testament regards Genesis to be among the law of Moses, because that was its full name and caption. Mm 
And so when it was written, it was written in between 1527 and 1487 BC. This is during the first 40 years of Moses' life in the courts of Pharaoh. So Genesis was being written before he led his people, for some context. And the audience was the nation of Hebrew slaves. Where and why? The readers, the original readers, we should say, of Genesis were located in Egypt. And the reason that, ex that uh, Genesis was written was to provide comfort and suffering, to provide the people with hope that God would rescue the enslaved Hebrews from their bondage. He wanted to show that God is faithful to his promises and a point toward Christ, showing how the line of the Messiah was narrowed down from simply the broad seed of woman eventually to the tribe of Judah. On the subject of promises, pulling from Genesis only, can you guys think of some promises of God that are fulfilled in Genesis, or the promises that are talked about in Genesis? Well, Adam and Eve, were, you know, when they ate from the tree, life, the, the declaration was that if you eat it, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. That's there in one sense. Other positive promises? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, don't apologize. Hey, that's a promise. Promise is a promise. So, what other promises or mighty acts did God do for his people in Genesis? When you think about it, these are stories well, of hope. The whole creation. Mm -hmm. You have creation. You've got Noah and the flood. You know? And the rainbow. Mm-hmm. You have that. So when you think of that, if you know that the rainbow was founded on this, mm -hmm. then any time for you, as a Hebrew slave trying to believe that God is still around, any time you see a rainbow in the sky, sure. it's a picture of God is faithful and God preserves his people, regardless of all the chaos around you. Mm -hmm. Some other promises is you have Abraham and Sarah mm -hmm. and their promise of a child. Mm -hmm you have the promise that Abraham's descendants would become a great nation in which they are right now. And knowing that promise, they realize we're actually the fulfillment of a promise ourselves. Every single one of them is. You have Rebecca having Joseph. You have the fulfillment of Joseph's dreams, which brings importance to how they came to Egypt and how things were originally supposed to go. So when you look at what Genesis is about, the main theme is the election of the Jewish nation, of God calling these people up and beginning to set them apart as his chosen people. The key verses that stand out in Genesis is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You have Genesis 3.15, which says, And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And this was Jesus, this was God speaking, and it was concerning what would happen between Christ and the devil, already setting from the very beginning this war that would ensue, but also showing who would be the victor. And then finally we have Genesis 50:20, which says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. And these were Joseph's words to his brothers at the end of Genesis. And these also were going to ring very true because if they could believe that, that God could redeem any circumstance for good, then he wasn't done with their situation yet. So finally we have unique features for the book of Genesis. So for starters, Genesis has been called the seed plot of the entire Bible. And the seed bed, seed plot, and basically what that means is... Um, a seed bed is a soil um, or a bed of soil that's prepared for planting a seed. It's also a place or a source of growth. So if Genesis has con is considered the seed plot, this is where God first starts to plant hints and promises and some direction as to what he's going to do. Some seeds that are planted is the idea that Israel is going to become a nation. You get the origin the creation of the world as we know it. You also see the origin of sin but you also get the promise of the Messiah and a future salvation coming through in this seed plot. Um, along with the fall of man, God's promise of salvation or redemption 
is recorded already from chapter 3. This promise has started. Um, the doctrines of creation, imputation of sin, justification, atonement, depravity, wrath, grace, sovereignty, and responsibility are all addressed. Things that people will be facing with from the end of time, God addresses day one. So you can look at first occurrence. And then in this, Christ is portrayed as both the creator and as the beginning. Things that would be echoed later in the New Testament. And with that, I'll open this up to discussion. Anything neat stand out to anybody? Any questions? Anything that just turned the light on for you? Even just anything that was just, man, that just, that was cool. Something you heard before, never heard before? Go for it. Well, can I say something mm -hmm. off this paper or not yet? Go for it. Okay. So I like under unique features how it's called the seed plot for the entire Bible. Because then when I look over here and it says the seed of the woman. And that's really cool to look at, to think of it in that way. And the bed of soil that he was really growing us all up. And it's awesome. Mm -hmm. like Love that. that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? It's when you plant the seed, you're... You know, you plant a seed for growth. So, you know, to see that and understand that now we're growing, we're growing the entire Bible, not not just us personally, but you know, that seed is to grow the Bible now. Mm -hmm. You know, what I see in that too. So that's, that's pretty. That's an interesting thing. Amen. When you were saying soil, I saw that as light. Mm. Our life, so, soil equals growth. So life equals growth. Yeah, that's, that's so much. Mm -hmm. Can I say another one? Go for it. I love. Um, I never <coughs> figured this out, and you know, and knew this until you said that Moses started writing it before yeah. he had left before he led his people. I never even considered that before. That's amazing. You think about what that must have done for the beginnings of his own personal relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So in Genesis, you have the record of people who <clears throat> talked with God very personally. People like Abraham, like Isaac, like Jacob, who literally wrestled God. And then you have Moses who I'm not one of the main three fathers, I'm not any of these other people, heck, I'm raised Egyptian, and then God also speaks to him later in Gen that we read in Exodus. Mm -hmm. But this is somebody who's been reading the faithfulness of God, who's been getting to know God mm -hmm. through the first portion of Scripture, and as he's writing this, he's going through records, and he's looking at his own history, and God is a part of it. Mm -hmm. So you can think of what that's going to do for his faith in the future. He's learning about God in that process like we do when we read. Mm -hmm. That's what he's getting to do as he compiles this. Also, I mean, he's there, he has all the Jews in front of him and he's in the, you know, the king palace. And, you know, Egyptians are known for their record keeping. and mm -hmm. know, So he uh, has privy to all that. Plus, he has the Jews there outside the gates with him. That he, the true stories of what he's reading, he goes and talks to him. You know, he could, you know, and now he gets a live word, a live testament of, or he sits and listens to him, you know, that he hears the stories of these. You know, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, kind of interesting that the. Egyptians allowed him to explore that. And how did he find out that he was <coughs> that he was Hebrew? That he was yeah. How did he find that out? That was that something that God revealed? So, knowing um, well, he, when you read Exodus, um, he wasn't he wasn't raised from a baby. Um, his sister was watching in the bushes. His mom sent not she sent him off in the basket, mm -hmm. but then she had Moses' older sister Miriam watching nearby just to ensure and just keep an eye on Moses as he was floating along. Mm 
So when Miriam, his sister, saw Pharaoh's daughter and saw that she wanted to adopt him, and, you know, the Pharaoh's daughter had no idea where Moses came from. As far as she knows, it could be an abandoned child, and this child has just miraculously come her way. And Miriam runs over to her and says, um, asks her, you know, about the baby and stuff, and God puts it on Pharaoh's daughter to ask, like, is there someone who could raise this child for me for the first, like, few, few years? Because I don't know how to take care of a baby necessarily. So Miriam says, I know somebody who can. So she goes and she gets her mom. Right. So Moses' mom gets to raise him up until the point where he would be weaned and then go on. So his early years, a few early years, he gets to still be with his natural mother. And then the rest of his life is raised in the Egyptian palace. And for the Egyptians specifically in their culture, um, they had a, they despised the Hebrews um, for a couple reasons. Um, some were ethnic reasons, um, among other things. Mm -hmm. So, while he would be accepted by his family, there were certainly going to be others around him who would be very quick to point out his differences. So, he may not have realized it young, but he certainly would have found out while growing up as other people made it clear, you don't belong here, or you don't fit in. So, he was torn, and he lived in two worlds. And how often for that with us? We belong to the nation of heaven while we're born and we're raised here. So... So with that, we can go ahead and jump to Exodus. And if you guys think of anything else in relation to Genesis or at any point to one of these other books, feel free to go for it because you'll start to see a lot of interconnection. So don't feel like you can't talk about Genesis again. Hey, yes. Who exactly are the children of Israel? So the children of Israel, Jacob, if you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob is renamed Israel as part of the promise that God gave Abraham. So when you have the children of Israel, at first that's referring to his actual 12 sons, which then become the ancestors to the 12 tribes. So the sons of Israel refers in the very beginning to his actual descendants, who are slowly but surely becoming a full-blown nation, which then they'll be addressed just as Israel. And did someone else start to ask a question? Yeah, I'm just trying to think back of who put Moses in the basket. Mm -hmm. Miriam. Um, Miriam did, not the mother. I would have to go ahead and I can look that up, but it's one of the two. Yeah, so, I'm just trying to remember. Mm -hmm. Either his mother did, or when you read it, or she tells Miriam too, and to go ahead and watch, yeah. but it's the mother's plan. Yeah. So she's invested exactly either way. The first few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So from here we have Exodus, in which the theme is now the redemption of the nation. So the author, once again to Exodus, is Moses. And there's some additional proofs of authorship for this book. We have some of the same proofs that, were, uh, that applied to Genesis. In addition to those proofs, the vividness of certain accounts like the crossing of the Red Sea and the receiving of the law at Mount Sinai suggests that the author had to have had a first-hand acquaintance with those events. Also, there's a detailed knowledge of the geography of the desert, which is incomprehensible apart from first-hand experience, which would be gained by living in the wilderness for many years. Which Moses, after, so we looked at his first 40 years you know, of life, which, when he's writing Genesis. Then comes an instance that you read about in Exodus, where he catches um, a Egyptian, um, an Egyptian owner who is attacking a Hebrew slave, and he jumps in on the slave's defense, ends up killing the Egyptian, and then, you know, tries to cover it up. But then the next day, he sees two Hebrews arguing, and when he tries to negotiate and tell them to chill out, one of them says, "What are you going to do? Kill me like you killed that Egyptian?" Sure. And then he panics, realizing people saw him, so he runs. And he lives in wandering in the desert and starts a family, but he's living out there for 40 years. So it's during these 40 years that he would start to go ahead and gain that knowledge of the area outside of Egypt, which is what people look at as a proof. Another proof is that the author had extensive knowledge of Egyptian custom and Egyptian practices, which Moses would have. And finally, when Jesus and the New Testament writers quoted Exodus, they would attribute it to Moses, saying things like, and Moses said. So, 
those are additional proofs for this book specifically. So Exodus was written between 1445 and 1405 BC, which is now during Israel's time wandering in the wilderness. So this is after the confrontations with Pharaoh, after they crossed the Red Sea, and during the time that they're wandering, Moses is now writing about what just led to these events. Um, and it was being written to the 12 tribes of freed Hebrew slaves who are now starting to develop into a theocratic nation. A theocracy is a nation in which God is the ruler or king. So you're starting to have a group that's forming where God is the governing head. And this is going to be crucial because they've been living like families and tribes, but now they're attempting to form and operate as a united people when they were just a bunch of families before. So these are a lot of changes that they're trying to undergo at once. As we mentioned, the readers were located in Egypt and in numerous places in the wilderness of Sinai. Um, Exodus was written to show how the family of Jacob developed into the nation of Israel. It was written to record the redemption and deliverance of that nation. It was written to instruct that obedience was necessary for a holy nation and to show God's faithfulness to the covenant of Abraham. Hey, Casey. Yes. I know you cover this actually in the other course that you've, uh, you've been developing for the history. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> would you say, based on the, the study we did elsewhere, because you just kind of alluded to it here, that God really dealt with the people instead of, He didn't deal with individuals nearly as much or from His vantage point or how He. Uh, disciplined or trained or whatever, he did it as a nation instead of as individuals. Would you say that's true or not? I would say both, okay. because you have cases where you have some, you have cases where you have some group of Israel sinning and they're the only ones dealt with and not the rest. Mm -hmm. If he dealt with them only as a nation, then everyone would get hit every time that one person messed up. So you see differences in cases where it looks like there's an outer field. The more that you study, the more you see it's because they actually had a part to play. Um, something that's not covered extensively here, but in later courses is um, if you read carefully through um, Exodus and some of the first beginning rules of the later half of the book that God gives. For instance, there's a law that states if anyone is worshiping another God, the sentence is death and that the people are required by law to do it. So if you see somebody doing it and you don't report them, you're just as guilty as the person doing it because you're potentially allowing this thing to spread. So when you understand that, then it makes sense why if you had this pocket of people and there's an outer pocket of people who know about it but aren't dealing with it and are just living in ignorance, that they would end up getting some pushback as well because that's actually a part of their law. So you have these different fields and different rings where at times, it's incorporated as a whole, and other times it's just individual, and it's circumstance by circumstance. There's like we were talking about that when, um, when the, the 70,000 were killed, uh, when the ground opened up and swallowed mm -hmm. up, that kind of thing, it was, it was the whole nation wasn't being judged, but those, that, that pocket or that section, that section mm -hmm. that was a, ignoring the law, ignoring the relationship mm -hmm. that God was trying to establish. Yes. And, or, the, or, I guess I, I really wanted to get the, the, the whole idea of why I mentioned nation, because so many times when we look at scripture and it'll say um, that my plans for you to prosper you, whatever, it's talking to the nation. Mm -hmm. It's not talking to a person. We're talking whole nope. nation, and so then we today, what we kind of will say, okay, well I pull that little scripture out and say God's plans for me is to prosper me and all these things. I'm choosing to take that promise that was really given to a nation that is even under an old covenant and apply it to me in new covenant. Mm -hmm. And that may or may not be accurate. I know God said, you know, we have plenty of New Testament scriptures that talk about how he wants to prosper us and prosper us even as our soul prospers, these type of things. But sometimes I think that we have a tendency to, when we look at these Old Testament things, to just uh, uh, take these uh, apples and put them together with these oranges and say they're the same. Well, what you have also is you have several verses in the New Testament that show you that and that teach and Paul was someone who taught this and others that when you're saved, you're grafted into 
the family of Abraham as spiritual heirs. And that now you're under, you know, they use the example in Galatians of you were once children of, you know, Hagar, like Ishmael, but now you're children of Sarah. And what she's indicating, and he says specifically, you are now children of the promise. Those promises, Jesus fulfilled the old covenant and then created a better one, but it didn't mean that the blessings that he promised then necessarily died off. The, those same promises still affected Israel. And when you look at God addressing Israel as a nation, for instance, the promise to prosper them as a nation, a nation is built up of people. So naturally that's going to mean that he's also prospering the people. He's not the prosper, nation wouldn't prosper unless the, unless the people did. were. Mm -hmm. So totally things are intertwined. Uh, I just know that many times we'll have a tendency to read more into something or even try and have an application that may or may not be accurate. And we need to, and the reason I'm bringing it up is I really love the, the fact that we're, we want to start everything with Christ, start everything with what He did, and then as we look at these things, do it as saying, okay, He fulfilled this, therefore we don't have to worry about any of the, uh, if you don't do this, this will happen, mm -hmm. because He's already taken care of that. So all we have to really, when we look at the Old Testament, look at the promises that are blessing, because he's already taken care of everything that deals with where we'd be punished. Honestly, punished. honestly, all you have to do is just look and see what gets synced up. Because if the Bible is inerrant and it says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then his character is the same in the Old Testament and the New. God does not have schizophrenia. He's not bipolar. <laughs> so he's the same all the way through. Which means if he's giving promises in the New Testament that are under that new covenant, you're going to see promises that are the same in both covenants because he's the same God. Right. So you can just easily look and see, we know that God is faithful and that he blesses obedience. You see that in both. Sure. What you begin to see is that where you fail in certain things that would potentially steal a blessing, Christ is covered. There's some common sense things. If you jump off a building, you're going to break your leg. Common sense still remains common sense. But as far as some of these global laws, the major punishments that were beyond your control, Christ covered those. But it's also vital to know because when you know them, you know that much more what he did. So key verses for uh, the book of Exodus. <laughs> Um, you find in chapter 1, verse 8, we read that a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. And why that's important is that at the end of Genesis, Joseph has risen up as the second most powerful person in Egypt. And his family has a lot of favor as they're increasing and multiplying and they're well cared for. But by this point, you've got a new king who either doesn't remember Joseph. And the terms used when you read scripture knew nothing about Joseph basically can mean one of two things. That either he didn't know who he was at all. Or he just didn't see the significance and he didn't care. So what results is the enslavement. But we read that God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant to Abraham, his promise. Mm -hmm. And Abraham was promised that God told him, in the future, your descendants will be slaves to another nation, but I will rescue them. So this was all part of a promise long foretold, that their salvation was coming. In 3.8, we read that God came, so I have come to lead them out of Egypt. God telling this to Moses, telling him, I'm doing it now. I am coming to save them. In 12.27, we read, uh, for he passed over the houses of the Israelites, and this is a reference to the final plague, which would lead to the Passover, um, the creation of the Passover celebration, where the blood of the sacrificial lamb covered and death did not come over the Israelites or any who had the blood over their door. Mm -hmm. um, in 19, chapter 19, verses 3 through 6, God tells Israel that you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. Mm -hmm. And everybody in this room has pretty much had foundations of worship, so you guys are very familiar with that sentiment. Mm -hmm. And finally, what would become very, very key to them as a nation is this is a now addressing as a nation that he is the Lord their God. So they've been in an environment in an Egyptian culture where there's many gods, but he's telling them, I'm your one, I'm your only, I'm your everything. Mm 
And finally, unique features for the book of Exodus. It traces the rapid growth of Jacob's descendants. So like you said in the first, set, um, in the first book, you're asking about the sons of Israel. This is tracking their growth from 12 families into a nation, a nation big enough that would threaten the Egyptians, who were a huge nation themselves. Um, God is shown to be more powerful than any sorcerer or any kind of magic throughout the books of Exodus. Um, a multitude of miracles are performed in order to preserve the Israelites. So you see that God is willing to come down and perform the miraculous. He's willing to get invested in the affairs of men in order to prosper his people. Um, it deals with the origin of the Passover, and Christ is portrayed in a few ways. He's represented in the Passover lamb, in the deliverer, as the mediator for his people, the lawgiver. He's represented in the tabernacle, and finally, as the high priest. So, with that, we got a few more minutes. So, anything get anybody excited? Things stand out? Questions? What hit you in Exodus? I know we gave you plenty. I know we Marvin included. <laughs> I know you don't have it. It comes out in other classes and other mm -hmm. places. But one of the things that I dearly love is, is the, um, the when you talk about how Jesus is portrayed here. In that Jesus in the book of Matthew actually follows the same path uh, as, the, as the Israelites did. He went to Egypt. And then he came back through the Red Sea, right? Comes back to um, now. He didn't split it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but he, um, but he, um, the Red Sea for him, because for them it was a it, there was a baptism. Water was split, and then they passed through it. With well, Jesus, whenever he was baptized, uh, and then that's when the Holy Spirit came to him and it came upon him, and then as he moved on from there into all of these things, as the deliverer, mediator, and all these things, after the Passover. So he, he was the Passover lamb, yes, but he also, he exemplified in his life, and Matthew went to a lot of trouble, and if you've already had Gospels, you know this, he went to a lot of trouble to lay out and make sure it was clear that Jesus followed the same path as the Israelites did. That's good stuff. Anybody else? <laughs> All right. Then on that note, it's 745. And we'll consider that end of session one.